Hey, well, we hope you enjoyed this episode. <laughs> Michael. This is Auto Collabs. <laughs> Michael, we do the outro after the intro, after the interview. Uh, uh, yeah. Man, um, you know what it comes down to? I think I just need more podcast experience. That's what it is. You've been, I say you that haven't all the been time doing this you. long enough. Amateur it's, hour all the time. You all know. the time. Yeah. Yeah. I say that about Michael Cerro all the time. All, I mean, literally, it's how I introduce you to my friends. I'm like, this guy, he's okay. But if he only had, <laughs> he's taking his in-ears out. If you're just listening, he just pulled his in-ear monitors out, stood up from it's his such desk. an investment to put left. these earphones back uh -huh, in. Now you got to get those that. things back in. Uh, I'm so excited for today's de uh, today's guest. Dan Shine, the editor for Fix Stops for Automotive News, is one of the most down-to-earth people that I know in this industry. And I guess appropriately so. He covers fix stops, which there is frontline down and, to and, earth. And not just that, but Dan has been such, like, so good to us uh, yeah, from the More Than Cars perspective, just sharing what's going on with the series that we're doing. I'm excited to get a little bit more knowledge of who he is, what he's done in the industry, um, because, like, that's what this podcast is all about, mm -hmm. just really diving into the real conversations and the people behind what makes this industry tick. So we hope you enjoy this conversation that we get to have with Dan Shine. Uh, Dan, thank you so much for joining us today on Auto Collabs. It's good to be here with you. Thanks. Uh, pleasure. Glad to do that for the invite. So you're somebody, like, because you're on the fixed stops side of uh, coverage, I feel like you have an inordinate connection with the front lines of the auto industry. How do you view fixed ops versus sales? Let's get you in trouble with the first question. Well, that's, you know, the fixed ops are they're they're my people. I mean, you know, they're you know they're they're not worried about their blow drying hair and stuff like that. You know, they're they're working with their hands and you know they're they I mean they they run the dealership. They make they make the money for the dealership and uh, you know it's they're uh you know they're not a show horse or a show you know they're a workhorse and. So I, you know, they're, I, you know, I, I joke, but, you know, getting to know them, you know, getting to know people and stuff who are in, you know, service and parts and collision. And they're just, you know, they're, you know, I've, I've said this many times, but they're just really smart, creative, innovative people who, when, you know, things are thrown their way, they figure out a way to you know, overcome it and, and continue to, you know, make revenue and, uh, you know, get people's cars in and out. Um, so, they're just, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that I'm not, you know, covering the sales side of things at dealerships. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm with, the, I'm with the real people. <laughs> I'm in trouble. Uh, See, there it was. No, it's true. <laughs> there it Come was. on. Come no, on. but you're, but you're, you're like not a historied uh, automotive person. It's no. you haven't been in automotive for years and years and years. This is fairly new in your journalistic. Uh, well, let's uh, talk about that. Work. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I mean. But I, I grew up in Detroit, so it's like it's it's, okay, it's yeah. automatically in the, in the blood. blood a little no bit. No escape, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. But it, yeah, so, it's I I uh, yeah I you know the short the very short version of it is you know I I worked in newspapers for sixteen years in Dallas and in Detroit, uh, then went and worked at University of Michigan for sixteen years uh, working at a sorry. think tank. I know, I know, I'm a Michigan State grad. I think how how do I feel? Oh no! Yeah. <laughs> Someone has to keep an eye on them. You know, yeah, right. We got a whole spy routine. <laughs> Inside right guy over yeah. there. Um, but I had, you know, I had a, a friend, a former colleague from the Free Press who was been automotive news and was a recruiting guy. And he said, you know, I've got this job. And if you know anybody who's interested, and I kind of looked at it and said, I might be interested in this. And, you know, and know I've always guy. been, I've always loved autos. And again, like growing up in Detroit, uh, you know, you, you just can't escape you know, the industry and its influence on the city and, and, and how it kind of shaped this city uh, for better and for worse at times. Um, and so, uh, you know, so it was really interesting to me. And then, you know, now, you know, kind of immersing myself in, you know, service and parts and F&I and, you know, used. Uh, it's, you know, it's been fascinating. I love it. What? Okay, so I, we, we always ask the ask a couple questions beforehand and i i think this is pretty unique but you're when you started it was right before the pandemic yeah is that right yeah yeah that I mean, had to be wild it, it was yeah it was it was kind of funny because I, I was working at the university of michigan so i was commuting you know two hours round trip every day and i was like god i really you know it'd be nice to have a job where i wasn't you know 
you know, so you know, so far away, and you know, then you know, in a blink of an eye, I'm at my you know kitchen. How's table. your living room sound? <laughs> yeah, right. right. <laughs> um, but yeah, it it uh, you know, it was it was a you know a, a great match, and and I uh, so I went to NADA, you know, so I went to my first NADA, and you know, everything was cool, and you know, and and soon after, my boss at the time said there was a small group of fixed ops directors they meet twice a year i know the guy who runs it he says you can come kind of be a fly on the wall and just kind of hang out and learn you know and so as this trip to phoenix is approaching in march you know you keep you know you know the world's you know coming to an end and i kept thinking oh you know do i really want to go there you know but i was like i'm new to this job and i'm like i'm not gonna tell him i'm not gonna go so my, my wife's like you know are you sure this is good i'm like oh, i'll be fine you know and and so i went and you know i had a I was going to go go watch some spring training baseball. And I had a buddy who was the team doctor for the Phoenix Coyotes. He said, come on to a game. And, like, you know, so I'm like, how oh, these great amazing. plans. And then by the time I got there, like, you know, baseball was shut down. Hockey was shut down. And, you know, we were working from home. They, you know, said, don't come into the office. And so I went, you know, so, you know, I'm here in Phoenix. And I've got to go to, actually went to Tucson to a Subaru dealership and did a story. And then took the red eye home to Detroit and, set up shop on you know my kitchen table for you know the next i don't know whatever it was year and, and years later my my boss at times like i can't believe i made you go to that <laughs> you know i'm like yeah i was kind of wondering myself but man you're in auto let's go yeah, yeah. We're and, running. And it was great it was, you know great meeting and I, I still go to that meet they meet twice a year in mostly in orlando this one's just kind of a special trip to phoenix so i go twice a year and you know saw the same people and always come away with some great story ideas so that you know it's been great it's been a great relationship what's the what's the biggest standout for you i mean you mentioned working in detroit so the auto industry always it's kind of the lifeblood of of, a, of that city but now that you're officially in the industry covering it it's your primary focus what are some things that you realize now about the industry that perhaps weren't on your radar before when you were just kind of you know working at the newspaper and being in detroit yeah, it's just, it, I think, you know, this how complex it is. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of numbers, which is not a, one of my strong suits. Um, so I'm like, uh, trying to avoid those whenever possible. But it's just, I, th I think, you know, there's just so much to it. There's, you know, there's so much behind behind the curtain, under the surface there of, of how things get done and the decisions that go into whether, you know, this is a new model or, you know, uh it's just there's there's just a lot of intrigue behind the scenes and a lot of so much history of you know and which i you know i like i'll be in these i just you know got done with the morning editors meeting and you know they were talking about this i'm talking about fisker and you know bankruptcy potentially and all this kind of stuff and there's just so much knowledge in the room of the people who've been at automotive news for a long time and they're bringing up you know context and background and you know this is the guy who did this and this is you know so I'm always kind of fascinated that just to kind of hear the history of it. And there's, you know, there's, you know, in some ways there's nothing new in automotive. It's just kind of a, a, a different version of something that has yeah, happened right. before. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm also dying to know, is it the auto industry? You, you mentioned numbers in the auto industry and we're always trying to measure stuff and yep. we're always trying to look yep. at data and that's did, a lot. Did of you guys lose right. him too? I did. I lost him. Oh, he gone. He's gone. It's it's one of those measure. We get yeah. is this now an episode of finish the question. Where <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, we'll see. It's like we'll a see. Mad Libs now all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're always trying to measure fill in the blank. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. That's um, the absolute best. Well, I want to take the conversation since he's not here anymore. Um there's there's an element of what you just said about automotive news where there's obviously a lot of history. There's a lot of things that have happened along the, along the years. And the context is so important to understand like current decisions or what's happening. But you, again, pivoting here, we asked you a few questions before the show. And you had mentioned actually that you like to participate in 200 mile relay races. I don't know if I say is that a real thing. I guess I, I guess I, I don't think I like or love to, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, you know, my friends are doing like it. So I'm like, like oh, it. it sounded like a good idea at the time, you know, Exp explain what that even so, is. So there, it's a, it's a, it's an event called Ragnar. And I, I think it used to be a Reebok brand, but I don't know if they still are or not. And they run these 
races they run either road races or trail runs and we've done both and this it's all happened like a, a friend of ours a friend of mine would do it with his work colleagues he, he works at a ad agency that does a lot of ford work and they would go and do these as kind of a team building thing and so we said well that sounds kind of cool you know so you get 12 guys you get two vans you pile them in it's basically like a re- relay race you know and the, the van number two goes ahead and then the, you know the first six guys in the first van run these different lengths of this run and then the, you know and then van two takes over and those six guys do it and then meanwhile van one goes to the bar and drinks you know for yeah. a while and you know and then meets up and so we did one from in michigan from muskegon which is down kind of the western southwestern kind of part of michigan up traverse city michigan which is up north 200 miles away and so you run basically so i basically i ran uh, two 10ks and a 5k roughly in about 31 hours um with very little sleep and, uh, and some drinking involved um and <laughs> i love the variable there yeah, yeah. and right the, that could really, that could really gets give a little team dice, an edge right you know. like the killer team are also killer drinkers yeah right yeah you get three quarters through the race and like the dark horse in the back might actually pull this one out and they're all i'm like the oldest guy in the group too so it's like you know i'm a little bit of a disadvantage so i'm like as long which, as you which make- leg do you take do you take like an early leg you're like, let's get this done. Well, actually, well, actually the one I we did in Michigan, I was the I was the twelfth leg, so you know, <laughs> I was like sitting around for like half the day the first day. I'm like, I just want to like you know go because I'm like, how much should I eat? How much should I drink before I have to run? And right. Uh, but then we did a we did a trail run this past year up in northern Michigan, up in I don't want to really say it's a mountain because it's there aren't many mountains in Michigan, but it's a a big long a big large hill. And this, but this one is like you have a campsite, and so you have a couple tents. And it's like, a, so it's like a little party central. And then like, you know, when it's your turn, you go up to the hill and then you, you run through the woods for, I think they did, had a three, uh, I don't know, like a three mile loop, a six mile loop, and then a eight mile loop. And it's like, you know, it, it was, that one was brutal. I like, I texted the group like halfway through the first one and I said, never effing again, am I doing this? You know, by the time we got to the bar after it was over, I was like, well, I might, you know, if I practice, if I trained more, I might. Not, yeah. Maybe. That's the way running always is. You got to, uh, once you do it, it's kind of addictive. And yeah, like, yeah, so there's not, one, there's, there's one there's I'm fun. trying to get everyone involved in. It's a, they call it the bourbon run, bourbon trail run. And so it's, I know the, people that have run that one and they the, love from it. From Louisville to Lexington and you go through yep. by all the distilleries and stuff. So that's this fall. <laughs> and so, that sounds like a, a cramp waiting to happen. Right. Yeah. yeah I'm not <laughs> sure. I was going <laughs> to say half, half of our listeners are like, this is a really involved drinking game. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. We can all stay <laughs> home. With an immense threat of dehydration. So it's the, 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 the funny story i will, I will get off this topic it, it's a great so when, topic. It, when the first started so that my friend did this and he's like we well, ought to try and do this and so we were at a birthday party of one of the guys and we're all like drinking and then so we start like recruiting people who are not at you know don't have their sen- senses with them and, and agree to do this because they're drunk and so <laughs> so there's like there's basically one running legitimate running store in my little town and so this friend of mine like goes and he's like you know looking for running shoes and he's like telling the guys like yeah you know we're gonna run this thing and you know this 200 mile thing. and the guy's like oh you're at that birthday party too <laughs> he's like how did no. you hear it he's like no, no i got a whole like you know i got 10 other guys just like you who've like got the same story you're coming in looking for running shoes so <laughs> oh that's hilarious yeah. it's all of a sudden the reason you're the fixed ops editor is really making so much sense <laughs> to me right now more than ever yeah see yeah <laughs> So. It, 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 like that, I honestly that that type of engagement, that type of camaraderie, and that that's exactly of, it's it's exactly what fix stops. And so, like, there's a relatable sense to like how you live life and yeah. who you're engaging with every single day. Um, I, you know, when you're looking at it right now, because you because you know the fix stops uh, side of maybe editorial news has to. Uh, live a little bit more in the dealership because the OEMs aren't talking about fixed stops that much, you know, right. not like, oh, you know. Yeah. yeah, right. Um, you know, the, uh, you're living in the dealerships. What's the, what's the big thing that everybody's trying to tackle right now and, and, and how are they kind of setting themselves up or, or questioning how they're going to continue to be successful over the next year? Well, th- a couple of things I'm interested in there, you know, it's always, retention again right it's it's customer retention and how how do we get these people to come back and you know people aren't buying these cars as frequently as they used to and they're not leasing them as frequently as they used to and so mm. there's just not that steady stream as usual and and you know people are keeping their cars for 10 or 12 years now in some cases so how do you go about 
breathing these people back in? What do you, you know, how can you, I think, you know, we just had a story in about, uh, consumer reports did a, you know, story of their members and, you know, everybody thinks, Oh, dealers don't go to dealership. They're more expensive. And so there's this kind of, you know, they're, you know, go to an independent shop. They're going to uh, treat you fair. They'll work with you on the price. And, and so there's, you know, there's a lot of, you know, hills to overcome there, a lot of obstacles in, in, in the public perception of, of dealership service providers. So, you know, what are you doing differently to try and, you know, show your value to customers out there? Um, and then, you know, EV, EV service is, an, is another thing. Um, you know, we've got a story running in the paper this coming week about, about that and a CDK story and service directors aren't really crazy about EV service. They're, you know, they're not sure about it, mm. but they also, realize that this is a great retention tool because you're not going to take your Rivian uh, to the pet boys necessarily to get whenever something goes wrong. And yeah. so they so they see the, re- they see the retention opportunity there. Um, and, and, you know, and everyone says, well, you're not going to have an oil change, but they're going to need tires more frequently than a typical car. And mm-hmm. a lot of dealerships have gotten out of the tire business because it's, you know, low margins and it's a pain to s- store them all there. And, mm-hmm. but now, okay, how do you, get back to being a tire dealer again how do you you know you've been telling your customer i'll oh, go down the street to you know discount tire or something and they'll take care of you and now you got to like change the mentality no <laughs> actually you're worth where the place that you come get tires for right you know, right I, I didn't think about that that's like, a big walk sending like people other places and now saying yeah. no 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 yeah yeah well, it's almost like you, you have to start now opportunity for dealers yeah. right like You know, because to your point and Kyle's point, like so much of the marketing that a dealership does is around selling the selling of cars. Yeah. uh, And then fixed ops kind of is the, you know, shoved over here into the corner. But dealers are so heavily invested in these initiatives anyways. And then, you know, the thing you said about Rivian, you know, who's going to market that they can do repairs on Rivian? Pet boys. Yeah. Good year. Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, but why did we lose all that business? And and that's why you didn't market it. Yeah. You didn't let people know that you could do it. Yeah. I think, you know, dealership service departments kind of didn't want to bother with, you know, glass repair. And so they, you know, that became a whole little separate industry, you know, mm-hmm. tires became a whole separate in- industry. And so now, yeah. you, you know, you got to try and, you know, change the story a little bit and say, no, oh, no, <laughs> you know, come back. We can do it. And, and so you do see a little bit of dealerships doing windshield repair now, try, you know, trying to get into that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's finding revenue streams, I think, yeah. you know, as, uh, you know, well, one, as retention tools, right? Like you just said, hey, this is a place where you can come back to no matter what your vehicle needs. And then the other piece is when you have revenue streams that are going away, fluid exchange, you know, tire t- or uh, oil changes, you start to have to f- open up new revenue streams. And so training those people, but also getting the marketing out there is going to be extremely important. Yeah. Because it is going to take time to retrain the customer. Like you can't just throw up a marketing campaign month one and be like, "Oh, we do tires," and everybody right, yeah, goes, like a big well, stack, stack of tires in the service right. Look, right. we've got tires. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, that'll sell them. <laughs> well, we asked you in. Uh, we asked you what in your mind is like a must talk about topic on this episode, and you basically said customer retention. You know, like it's something that dealership fixed ops departments struggle with. And what, why did you put that down? I had to come up with an answer. I did. I, did. Ah. I wanted to leave it blank, but I figured you you want you'd want to. Because two hundred mile races wasn't really a must talk about, but I just. Right. <laughs> um, oh no! I think I think it's just something that you know they continue continually struggle with. I mean, you know, another one is employee retention or technician recruiting. I mean, we write about every I'm week. Seeing, about I'm seeing some ridiculous flat labor rates for technicians. Are you seeing that across the industry too? Yeah, like. Yeah. People paying forty to fifty dollars flat rate labor. Yeah. Yeah. Which was like unheard of six years ago. It's you know, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it's you know, I've seen it cited maybe by NADA and it's you know, for every technician you lose, this is how much your fixed ops department loses in revenue because you don't have someone turning wrenches for you mm-hmm. yeah, for you twelve pay. months. And it's 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 an ungodly amount of money. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, I was just with somebody who's a Ford dealer and does a service and they're big into mobile, you know, mobile vans. Yep. And he's, I'm, you know, by June, he said, I'm putting 50, five, zero on the road. 
my goodness. To like this, putting 50 mobile vans on the road. Yeah, this is he, one he, dealer group. Yeah. He has, he has already has, you know, a handful out there already. And he said, I have so much work and it's, and, and, you know, they're, they're having a little bit of a long jam. Get to SodaCon. We're doing a panel on mobile, mobile fix stops, a mobile service with Ed well, Roberts. This, this gentleman Stevens. might be, I think might be, Probably the, the, so <laughs> you, you know him um but it's but it's you know it's amazing but it's it, like he said to me like you know to get into the shop you know um you know mr shine i might you know i might be able to get you in in you know two weeks or whatever or would you rather have my mobile service van and come tomorrow check it out if we can you know fix it get the parts it might we can do it the, the next day and i'm gonna say of course yeah he's not saying yes to that oh uh, right wow. so yeah. that was pretty yeah, i was pretty amazed but you know it's again that's just i think a you know, shows the creativity and, you know, an innovation that is in these departments. It's like, I've got a little bit of an issue that I'm getting a log jam, people trying to come into my service department. Mm -hmm. How can I help? How can I alleviate that? Well, I'm mm -hmm. going to, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to either, you know, I'm going to diagnose it that day and maybe fix it that day, or I'm going to diagnose it and fix it in a day or two when I, when the part comes in. Mm -hmm. you know and and, th and that's, that's how you that's how you retain lost. customers I, yeah it's a retention it's you own the servicing at that point like mobile service i think is is the way to go and you see so many people in the service vertical uh taking that as the route you know it, it's whole companies spun up under the mobile service business uh opportunity so if as an industry on the legacy or the OEM side, the franchise side, we don't take advantage of that or, or tap into it. We're yeah. doing ourselves a disservice. Yeah. Well, Dan, uh, always a pleasure. We went history to <laughs> running and back to what Fix Ops is focused on. We are all over it, and uh, you have uh, graced us uh, with so much good insight and knowledge over the over the uh, the time that we've known you. And and thank you also again for supporting us with the work that we're doing with more than cars. Um, we know you're a big proponent of that. Can't yeah, wait to see you uh, at a SoduCon this year, uh, but mainly just thanks for joining us here on this conversation on Auto Collapse. Thanks. Pleasure being here with you guys. Thanks for inviting me. Look forward to seeing you in May. All right, let's do the top three things you didn't expect to hear from Dan Shine that you heard during that interview. Kyle, first. Uh, 100 this, mile drinking game. No, it's 200, 200 miles. miles. 200 mile drinking game. I was yeah. like doing the math. I'm like, divide that. He said two 10Ks and a 5K. Well, I was wondering how anyone makes it to the 5K with that much drinking happening, <laughs> especially if you have to wait 31 hours, right? If you're like one of the last people to go, I think that's the worst. I'd, you're done. I'd be I'm you're in done. out of the gate. Then and you know, you know, they're in like a 93 Chrysler Pacifica. Is, I don't uh, even know I was, if they made I those, was. <laughs> I was actually picturing a Chevy Astro, right? Oh, or, yeah. so, or a GMC Safari. No, nobody it gets a Proud Caputo or Andrew Diffenderfer's Sprinter van. Like that no, no, doesn't no, 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 ever no. happen. GMC you know? Safari, zero tint on any of the windows. <laughs> Guys, I learned to drive on a GMC Safari, but my dad used to call it a truck because the steering wheel said GMC truck on it. We're like, dude, ain't no way this is a That's truck. the story yeah. you're telling yourself, dad. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. No, I, you know, the, like the meat of that was obviously there is so much conversation around retention uh, when it comes to customer loyalty and understanding how fixed ops is such a driver of that. We talk about it from the variable ops side so much is like, how do we just retain customers? But the retention is all on the fixed ops side. So I appreciate that he's bringing light to the stories that are happening like that across the industry. Without a doubt. Well, on behalf of Kyle Mountseer, Michael Cirillo, and myself, thank you for joining us on this episode of Auto Collapse. Welcome, Welcome to, to Auto, Auto Collapse. Collapse. <laughs> Why are we recording? Are we rolling yet? <laughs>